You are watching the Big Dog Post Game Show, brought to you by Viner Forgates and the Big Dog himself, Rick Jacklich, at the Jacklich Law Group. Good evening. This is the Turp Talk Post Game Show. I'm Wayne Viner. That's Mason Viner. Maryland goes to Michigan State and finally wins there. It's been since 1950. Mason, it was uh, it was a good win because we won the game. Not the most exciting game. What'd you make of it? Yeah, I thought that Maryland came out and gave everybody what they wanted to see at the beginning of the game with a much quicker start. But as Locke said in his immediate post game interview uh, that aired on NBC. Uh, they didn't necessarily have the middle of the game that they've had the last couple of times. So still looking for a complete fourth quarter from the Terps. But look, a 31-9 to win in a place that still puts 70,000 in the seats and a road Big Ten win for the Terps and 4-0, not much really to complain about. But I can find a few things. I don't have to look that far. Maryland gets five turnovers out of Michigan State, plus Michigan State goes for it early in the game from the one-yard line doesn't make it. So that's six times they don't score. Those touchdown passes went through the Michigan State receivers' hands a couple times. On the Maryland side, I feel I left 15 to 17 points on the field. If they played defense, I think, the way they could have, you'd probably get in the mid-40s. It was win the game like 40-something, 40 45 to 9. Um, but with all those turnovers, getting the ball six times and effectively turnovers, I thought they could have scored more. So let's look at that side. Yeah, they definitely could have. Uh, the interception in the end zone sticks out. Two missed kicks uh, today, which starts to kind of maybe think that uh, Jack Howes may not be the answer there. Um, it definitely is not as good as what it was last year with a true NFL kicker on the field for the Terps. But um, you you always are going to look back and say you could have done more in, in these opportunities. But to your point, you have an opportunity to really blow out a team on national television and make a huge statement for yourself for the second time that Charlotte game earlier this year. And you just kind of don't necessarily slam your foot on the gas. You don't, you don't really take the spirit of the game out of the other team you're playing. Instead, you let them hang around. And for a second there, it was looking like maybe a one score game late in the fourth quarter. Not something that I think locks as they showed him repeatedly on TV did not look very happy about it. And you know that he's going to say that they played to their standard for probably what, two and a half to three quarters of this game but you have to play four quarters if they want to make the impact that they believe they can in that locker room this year. This is the Big Dog Post Game Show brought to you by Rick Jacklich and, of course, your hometown Terrapin IT team at Viner Fourgates. We'll be back in a moment. I think the first thing that has to be proved by the lawyer on behalf of any client who's injured their neck or back is that the client was hurt, and they were hurt in this accident. And even though they had pre-existing problems, the damage to this individual client is much worse now after the crash than it was before. We do that with pain and suffering witnesses. We do that with doctors that know the individual patient. All right, back at the Viner Fortgate studio here. You, you were right. Marilyn was... Up 28 to 9, and then Tarheeb still gets an interception and sort of snuffs out the Michigan State threat. So I have a hard time being overly positive, but you're 4 0. Yeah, you're 4 0. You just won a, another game, you know, in almost, I mean, when you look at the final scores, which is some years from now, that's all that really people will remember from the season. Um, you haven't really had a close final score yet on the, on the record sheet for the season, but. Look, as they move forward in the next week, an Indiana team that's really struggling to play really any sort of competitive mm -hmm. style of football against the bigger teams other than that three quarters they played against Ohio State earlier this year mm -hmm. uh, in front of what should be a, one of the biggest crowds in the last at least two or three seasons with family weekend coming up next week in College Park. Mm -hmm. That you almost are looking for. When is that statement? When are they going to throw down the hammer and put up the 52 or 59 points that people expect out of this offense with this quarterback? and really put the whole thing together over four quarters today would have just been a great opportunity to do it. But you already pointed out some of the plays. Tarheeb Stills' interception where he steps out of bounds. There's another one that goes in that, just mm -hmm. leaving points on the field. He fell down on the 19-yard line anyway. But you start to look at those plays and say, great teams make all these plays. We might be a good team, which is better than what we've had around here in a long time. Right. But everybody's going to always say you could have been great. And, and that's – I'm almost falling into that hole, that – 
you win, you're 4-0. If somebody says you're going to be 4-0, you're playing Indiana, you expect to win that game, you're going to be 5-0 in this season. You, you should be overjoyed. Yet in watching the game, it just wasn't great football. Maryland's leading rushers have 38, 37, 32 yards. That's Littleton, Tagovailoa, and and then you had McDonald, McDonald. and then Hemby gets your, he's your leader in carries on the game, but he has 10 carries for 12 yards, which yeah. does not bode well necessarily for Maryland. Michigan State, as we talked about on the podcast, you talked about with Lamont earlier this week, really strong front seven. They were missing some pieces of that along with basically their entire secondary right. today, but. I don't want to belabor the bad, but I've got one more piece. Once again, super happy that we won the game. Maryland continues the defensive rotation almost to the point of mystifying me where you end up playing Sean Greeley at linebacker, but he gets a fumble recovery. Spragans is still in there. The Christian Teague plays a lot at defensive end or tackle. Wheatland's in there a lot, but Jay Sean Barham isn't. Uh, Gote's in there a lot, and he was effective, but Hippolyte isn't out there so much. You see Lionel Whitaker playing when the game's on the line. Corey Coley, guys that aren't really first-teamers. Why do you think that Maryland's stuck with this rotation of playing, to me, even down to the third-string defense, while the game's still in doubt? Uh, I think it's it's a combo right now for Locks. Um, obviously, building the program is still w where he's at in his stage of, of, I believe, what the view of the real coaching staff is. Uh, in College Park, along with uh, the fact that if you look at the last years going all the way back to when they had Brandon Jennings in there, and, and he got hurt, and then really never came back to the team after that, but that's besides the point, and guys like Isaiah Davis and Ayende Ely, who just were, you know, they were the only real linebackers that were playable on this team, especially at that position, I think you're looking at a rotation that's truly too deep, they like to mix in some pieces of their three deep on that, not exactly in love with them being on the field when the game's on the line, but I think those guys really have earned a role in the coaching staff's eyes. And, and look, we'll see if Wheatland kind of moved to that Jack or Sam linebacker position for Maryland today. I think it was a much stronger look against the run there and can definitely have some pass rushing. Barham should probably also join that rotation of playing two positions instead of just one, which would be the Mike and the Sam linebacker mm -hmm. for Maryland. But at some point, you're starting to see one injury in, which is Isaac Bunyan, a guy that Christian Teague's on the field almost every snap today. You know, he, when the snap counts come out, I wouldn't be surprised if he's near the top on the defensive side of the ball, that is something that you have to look at because Ankeman Sote has gone down with an injury already. He came back in the game, right. but they're starting to see those little banged up parts, and I think right. that might be why you're seeing such a wide rotation right now. Okay. Still trying to be positive. Still happy we won. You have Tyshea Johnson, wears 40. He, he played some. You have Phillips, who's supposed to be a big deal, wears number eight. And, and you rotate these guys out, and to me, once that ball gets inside the 20-yard line, you got to put them back in. Of course, I'm not coaching the team. These guys know what they're doing. They're 4-0. Play of the game has to be Maryland gets to the one-yard line early on. They run a naked bootleg, and Sean Greeley, as a fullback, not as a linebacker, now wearing number 22, catches a pass. Yeah, Maryland guy from, uh, I believe it's Hartford County, um, been in the program, walk-on guy. He's earned a scholarship. Mm -hmm. Actually, last year he's been all over the field. If you really pay attention, he was out there on like special teams oh, kickoff coverage. He's a special coverage. teams ace. I mean, uh, that this that year guy plays hard. Has taken the role with you know Joey Burns transferring to Charlotte along with that group of playing fullback. And look, you have to if you look at Maryland's film and you prepare for Maryland. Mm -hmm. You know he's in there on the Billy Edwards push play. He's in there when they're trying to run the ball between the tackles or run the quarterback sneak. Um, Four games in, maybe a little bit early because every team's now going to be looking at him as an actual threat to either run the ball and or catch it out of the backfield. But but that's why you do this. You, you that, put it in somebody's I mean, mind, you got to cover him now. Uh, but just identifies what they want in the guys in the program mm -hmm. and, and gets his moment out there, as well as Rex Fleming, who forced a fumble on the mm -hmm. kickoff. Uh, both of those guys walk-ons from Maryland, mm -hmm. uh, from kind of the lesser-known parts of Maryland mm -hmm. that, that are making an impact, that are, have a role right. in Lox's program, which is what he wants. And with that, oh, we got to throw out uh, some props to Bruce, who said you got to mention how hot Leah started. I think he was 9 for 13. He was super effective, and yes, that sort of went down in the middle of the game. You said after he hurt his elbow, it looks like his arm went numb on him, and that was greatly concerning, but probably not a long-term issue. He wasn't as sharp until you got to the fourth quarter. But, uh, hey, a win's a win. Uh, you're going to do a, an extended podcast with Ahmed? Yeah, we're going to have the Young Terps here. You'll be able to watch it on this YouTube channel as well as 
Ahmed's YouTube channel and anywhere uh, you get your podcast, just look up the Young Terps podcast and we pop right up. And Lamont Jordan and and I will recap this game uh, midweek and then look ahead to Indiana, a chance to go 5-0. and I got to look up the last time Maryland was 5-0. and It's been a while. Thanks for watching. I'm Wayne. That's Mason. Good evening. As the Terps roll 31-9.